stand with me as we read from Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, reading from verse 13 to verse 15 of Joshua chapter 5. <clears throat> and it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So the man says, No, but I'm here as the commander of the army of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and washed it him, saying, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Let us pray. Our Father, we just thank you the way you have dealt with men and women down through the ages when they recognize who you are and recognize your purpose. Speak to us through your word, O oh Lord, because we need it this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> this morning, my message asks this question. What does it mean to be number one? What does it mean to be number one? Or you could say, who really is number one? We are entering a new month in which we will celebrate Easter. It, I think it's kind of interesting to see that right after Black History Month, we're celebrating the Passion of Christ. I think it's interesting. I don't think it's by accident God has allowed them to do this. You remember as we went through February, I kept on talking about the history of our people as we traveled through time and space. And we talked about why we celebrate Black History Month when really it should be Black History Year because we were there from the beginning and be a part of the whole thing. And we said that the main reason for our celebration was to remind ourselves of the operation and the movements of our people, our group of people whom God has loved and cared for from the very beginning of time. From the very beginning of his story. So history is important because it gives us a sense of purpose of where we're coming from. It gives us a, a sense of pride in our accomplishment, in knowing that we are, and we were, and where we're from, and hopefully where God wants us to go. But we have to remember something. We have to be obedient. We lost our status because of disobedience, and we'll see that as we go along. One thing I believe that history can do to us, it can make us want to shout that God has been on our side. And therefore, we're number one. Have you ever noticed the people who always say God is with us, always think that God is not with the other people? Because God is with us. We're the only one. We're number one. And as I was listening to a brother named Rick Mobley, he says that there's a dark side to the push to become number one. It's very easy for us to watch sports fans and sports uh, men shouting, we are number one. Giving us a victory, so are the one side. Now, we're number one. And then it goes out to the field of, of, of uh, sports, whether it's football, basketball, cricket, whatever it is, they go down the sports field and they go out there to prove that I'm number one. But it's another thing when a, a race or an ethnic group begins to chant something similar. 
on a basketball court or on a football court, wherever you're playing your, your game, after the game, do you notice what the players do? They shake hands and they wish others good luck in their endeavors. However, when a race or a nation or ethnic group stands to brag that they're number one, there's always a bunch of dead people left over somewhere. Always some bodies lying around. They always will have unjust laws set up and a whole lot of people made slaves and servants of the group that claim that they're number one or they're in power. I don't think it's too far-fetched to continue to put one more sermon in about black history. We should, we don't get it often enough. But as African Canadians or Caribbeans or whatever you want to have after that, our history is as old as the Bible itself. Do you realize that all through the Bible are African people? From Genesis to Revelation. All over the Bible. It's just that when we read it, we've been brainwashed to think that Africa is not in Africa. All through the Bible, we encounter one African after the other. You go to Genesis chapter 10. tells us about a man named Nimrod. Nimrod was a mighty hunter before God, it says. And you know, I've always thought that, oh boy, he must have been really a good hunter, bringing on big game. But you know, that's not what it means. Nimrod didn't hunt game. He hunt people. And he built cities and kingdoms that even now, there are vestiges of it still going on in our world. He was a kingdom builder. He was an architect of the Tower of Babel. He didn't just hunt game, he hunted men. He was a mighty warrior and he built many cities in the land of Shinar and he ruled Assyria and he built Nineveh and he built Babylon. But he got so big and powerful that he thought he was exempt from obeying God. He was the first one who shake his fist in God's face and says, I can do it without you. You've given me enough power. I'm okay. He's the first man to declare he's a self-made man. And because of that, we're suffering the results of that. When Moses left Egypt, he left with an African wife. She was from Ethiopia. But you think about this. When children of Israel left Egypt, what were they? They were all Africans. You said they were Jews. No, they were Africans. Because if you stay in a continent for 430 years, you are the product or the native of that continent. Some of us have been in Canada for 40 years, and we're Canadians. We weren't even born here. But we call ourselves Canadians, especially when we travel, because we think it carries a certain distinction. When you go to the airport and they ask you what citizenship you are, what do you tell them? You don't tell them you're Jamaican or Trinidadian. Of course not. You tell them you're Jamaican, they search you and take away everything you got. <laughs> but when you say I'm a Canadian citizen, all the difference in the world. And when people live in close neighborhoods, they marry each other. They lived in, you realize they lived in Egypt for 430 years. Don't forget that all the Egyptian pharaohs and were Africans. The pictures and statues that they left behind shows us. If you ever get a chance to go to Egypt and you're in Cairo, go to the go and see the the, the pyramids and the Sphinx that guards the pyramid. And you tell me what feature the Sphinx is. And what color? We are in the Bible, folks. In the region, in the reign of King Zedekiah of Israel, 
it was Ebed Milek, an African, who confronted the king because they had done an unsavory thing to the prophet Jeremiah. They had thrown Jeremiah in a well, in a cistern. Fortunately for Jeremiah, the cistern was, was drying up. When they threw him in there thinking they were killing the prophet because he kept on preaching the word of God. That's why you need to tell people what you know about Jesus today. They cast Jeremiah and left him in the well to die. And an African who was a member of the court went to the king, Zedekiah, and said, you cannot do this. You have done an awful thing to the man of God. And the king, Zedekiah... I mean, Zedekiah says to um, Ebed Melech, well, why don't you go do something about it? Bible tells us he got a whole bunch of whole clothes and, he, and rope and he threw it down in the well and says to Jeremiah, put the rope under your arm to cushion it. This is how much this man was involved with the prophet. Put it on your arm so you won't be bruised, my dear man of God. And took several men, 30 men, I think it was with him, to pull him out of the mud and the mire. And when the Babylonians came into the city, when the city finally fell, God said to the prophet, go and tell ebed Melek that even though everyone will be destroyed by the, the enemy, I am going to protect you because you protect my man. And I'm going to bring you back to your country where you're going to establish yourself. Genesis chapter 10. And if you don't, if you got a pen, write it down, beloved. Go home and read Isaiah chapter 38. It's amazing how history writers stole Egypt out of Africa and put it in the Middle East. You see, if one race decides to, 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 to be number one, any race decides desire to be number one, that race will attempt to deny the reality of God's word about another race. And they did such a good job during slavery. I'm not going to tell you about this. I'm just going to give you a, a name. You all are familiar with Google. Go on Google the slave Bible. You see what they did with the word of God to convince Africans that you were slave. The Bible has what, 30, 66 books? The slave Bible has 20 something. You would not believe what they will do when they say they are number one to convince the ones who they are pounding into the ground that they are unworthy. Now when we come to the New Testament, we find that Jesus spent, spent the first couple of years of his life where? In Africa. You remember what the angel says to Joseph? Take the young child and flee to Egypt. Where is Egypt? So the, for the first couple of years of Jesus' life, he spent it hiding out in Africa. Then we, see, we saw last week when we talked about Simon from, uh, Simon from Cyrene, which is in North Africa. He was the one who helped Jesus carry his cross to Golgotha's hill. And by the way, the Bible tells us that the word Christian was first called by people in the church in where? In Antioch. Let me tell you a little bit about the church in Antioch. Write it down again, Acts chapter 13, verse 1. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1, we, we are told who the leadership of that church was. The church that when people saw them in operation said they are just little Christ ones because they're just like Jesus. We're given the names of the elders of the church in Antioch. The, la the la neighbors who, the, 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 the leaders, they were prophets, the Bible says, and teachers. And they were the ones who laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul, later the apostle Paul, to anoint them for missionary work. Who were these men? Four elders. Teachers, the teachers were Barnabas, Simon, who is called Niger, the black. Another one was called Lucius of Cyrene. 
which is in North Africa. You see, in the very beginning, folks, the church had heavy color in there. And leaders, because they didn't look at your color, they didn't look at what you possessed, they look at what your heart was like. And they look at who was number one in your life. We need to realize the importance of God's choice of Africans in the Bible because it shows everyone, no matter what color you are, that long before racism raised its ugly head, there was a God who was free to choose anybody he wanted to choose, and he did choose. God made us an, an, an array of colors, even within our own African culture, we are different colors. Some are brown, light brown, dark brown, dark, dark. It's amazing that the only part of creation that lets color gets in the way is people. You ever seen, you, you know, you, some of you back home you used to have dogs in your yard. and Some of us had a lot of dogs. But uh, did you ever notice the dogs never thought about what color they were? They, they fought if you take their food, you're in trouble. They may fight to dominate another, but it was not about what they look like. Do you realize that no race or nationality can claim exclusive right to God? Even though God called Israel out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land, that does not necessarily put God on their side. Let that sink in for a minute. Just because God had chosen them and they were chosen people doesn't mean they have exclusive rights to God. You see, God loved the people in the promised land. He loved the Canaanites. <coughs> and he gave them 430 years to repent of what they were doing because they were set up by Nimrod way back over there. And God gave them 430 years to repent and turn away from their wicked ways. And they did not. And so God brought Israel to that land to be his chastening rod upon a disobedient people. And if you remember your Bible history, later on, when Israel got into the land and became just as sinful as the Canaanites who they had replaced, what did God do? He brought the Africans and the Babylonians to Israel to discipline and chasten the nation who had gone pagan all over again. He brought them in to bring judgment against Israel. Now, after Moses had led Israel for 40 years, Joshua took over. We just read the, the account. And Joshua must have felt Moses is gone, I'm now number one. He was a young man, I'm sure he was enthused. And not only that, but God had talked to him and told him, you know, be not discouraged, because I'm with you. You know, and over and over God told him, <clears throat> Joshua chapter one, God told him, be strong and be of good courage. For to this people you shall divide us you shall divide as inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Why would God repeat himself so many times to Joshua? Because Joshua was afraid. But God had to encourage him and he says, uh, be very courageous and you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the left or to the right that you may prosper wherever you go. So Joshua stepped out, recognizing he's a blessed man. Nothing can go wrong for me. God has blessed me. And God says to him, Joshua, what I want you to do now, I want you to go into the promised land. This 40 years is over. It's time for some movement. And so they prepared to go. But the river Jordan was at flood time. No one crossed the river Jordan at this time of the year. So you can imagine Joshua thinking of himself, you know, 
I have to see what God's going to do now. God said, well, Joshua, this is what we're going to do. You get the priest to pick up the Ark of the Covenant, which represent me, and tell him to head towards the overflowing River Jordan. And Joshua, when the lead priest's foot touched the water, the water is going to back up and pile up like a mountain. Now, if Joshua wasn't really sure about himself and what God had said, he'd probably question, wouldn't he? But he was out. And as soon as the priest put his foot in the river, the overflowing part of it, the water backed up. And the people walk over on dry land. That means it was dry people. The, 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 not even the, 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 the soles of their slippers or whatever they were wearing were wet. The Bible said they went over on dry land of a river that was overflowing and dangerous to everybody else. And then the Lord said to Joshua, okay, tell the priest to get out the water. And they came out the water, and the Bible says, everything went back to where it was before. Water flowing this bank, etc., etc. Now, <clears throat> to this generation who saw this, they hadn't seen nothing like this since Moses had opened what? The Red Sea. And their parents and grandparents crossed over. So after the last person stepped out of the river of Jordan, which was the priest carrying the Ark of God, everything went back to normal. And they were now on the proper side of the river Jordan. The Bible says that on that day, God exalted Joshua in the sight of all the people, and they held him in high honor. I repeat, they held him in high honor all the days of his life, just like they respect Moses. So you can imagine Joshua is now feeling pretty good about himself. He ought to. So hello, who is number one? The people of Israel would shout back, we are. And as Joshua got near to Jericho, and he was, I imagine, thinking of battle strategy and plans, the Bible says he saw a man standing ahead of him with a drawn sword in his hand. This man must have been a powerful looking man. He must have looked like a great warrior. And maybe as Joshua looked at him, maybe Joshua is thinking to himself, well, maybe this guy didn't get the memo that God had used me to open up the river Jordan, and here we are. So Joshua says, hey, buddy, there's going to be some fighting around here shortly. So do you mind telling me whose side you're on? Are you on our side or on the side of our enemies? The Bible said the man turned around to Joshua and says, listen, buddy, I don't get involved in taking sides. So I am neither for you or against the Canaanites. You don't understand who I am because if you did, you would want to make sure you're on my side. And then the man says, I am. It's amazing when you hear that word, I am. It does something for me. I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and here I am. That was what Moses had gone to, to uh, Egypt and tell the, the, Is the Israelites. I am have sent me to you. And here he is now to Joshua, second leader of Israel, saying, here I am the leader of the army of the Lord. By the way, this was none other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is one of his appearance in the Old Testament. Whenever you see that, the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus. 
And remember that the New Testament tells us that Jesus is the commander of the army of the Lord. So in verse 14, it says that Joshua fell on his face and worshipped. Look at the difference from being number one to being on his face before our Lamb of God. He's on his face and he's worshiping. And he says, what has my Lord has to say to his servant? From being number one, he's now a servant. Really the word there is slave. What you have to say to your slave. Because I have nothing that is instructive or powerful in my life. Because my strength is not in me. But you are the commander of God's army. What can I do? What's my next order? The commander of the army of the Lord said, Remove your sandals from your feet, Joshua, for the place where you are standing is holy. You've never heard an angel say that in their appearances in the Old Testament, have you? But the Son of God could say it. And God said it to Moses at the burning bush. Take off your sandal because the place on which you stand is holy ground. So whatever, however, whoever's history we are studying, we are always trying to prove that God was on our side. In whatever happened to us, but that is not the important, the most important point, is it? Everybody's history has one, some good part and some bad part. Every country has had times when they've acted cruelly to one another. Just look around our world today at what's going on. I remember when the war started in, in, uh, with Russia uh, and uh, Ukraine. I remember them saying that the people who were trying to escape uh, Ukraine was Russians. That most of the folks in Russia are related to people in Ukraine. Some were saying we can't go and fight them. They're our brothers and our grandmothers and so on and so forth. But here they are two, almost two years now killing one another. Look at what's going on in Palestine. But not even say that. Look what's happening to our African continent. Brothers killing one another senselessly. You see, mankind's history has been one of man's inhumanity to man. Because they think I'm number one. I must rule you because I'm better than you. I'm more educated than you. I'm this. I'm more this and more that. But Joshua in his ethnic pride, found out that God didn't choose sides like the way he thought God did. And the New Testament explained to us why. Again, the Apostle John said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whoever believed what? Shall not you know there's that word whoever one of the greatest words in the history of words whoever means anybody black and white poor rich the street person the person in suburbia wherever you live it means you I don't see anything in John chapter 3 and verse 16 that talks about color or financial status or prestige in our world for God so loved the world God doesn't choose sides Jesus came into the world to sign up everyone who wanted to choose him God chose mankind and Jesus come to sign up as many as possible who will listen to the message and become a different person in our world so that we can lay down the tracks for others to follow. You see, you got to remember something. God loves everybody. 
but he also have special concern for the poor. And God's concern for the poor is that they improve themselves from this situation. But that does not mean he loves them more than anybody else. Most of us have families, and you have children. Whether it's three or four or five, whatever you have. But there's always one child that needs more attention than one. Or there's always one child you don't have to worry about. You said, so, so Jenny, it, they're going to be all right. But the ones who kind of, you know, a little bit off track and doing this, you spend more time with them, don't you? What makes us think that we're better, better parents than God? Some of us, God needs to work with a little, more, a little bit more attention. And that's us, from, because from the beginning we were rebels. Yes. But he loved rebels. He loves to see rebels turn around. He loves to see rebels turn from being rebels to become revolutionaries and to revolutionize our world for God. What was Jesus trying to get across to us when he says, one day when we get to heaven, he's going to look at us and says, whatever you did to one of the least of my brothers. One of the least. Not the highfalutin super saint. But what you do for the least of one of these my brothers, I'm going to bless you. Because that's my heart. That's the heart of God. To the downtrodden. Don't you go making a judgment on people when you don't know their history. Because some of them be messed up because of their history. But our job is to go out <clears throat> and, and pay a little bit more attention to those people. Just like in our family. You pay attention to that little one who just can't seem to get anything right. Justice not only mean that everybody get the same opportunity, but that sometimes... We have to adjust the system to bring those back into the system who have been ignored or have been excluded. Did you hear that? Justice not only means that everybody gets the same opportunity, but that sometimes we have to adjust to make sure, as they say, no child is left behind. You have to. It's no mystery. That's God's intent for our world. And for us as Christians, that's where we ought to be living. But the only time we are going to pay attention to those who are living, are being adrift, are being drifting, is when we recognize that God didn't call me to be number one. He called me to be a servant. You see, God has called us to live our lives in such a way that Jesus Christ becomes number one in our lives. That's why I hate when <coughs> you, know, you, hear, um, you see this program on TV and they start, oh, you know, I, <coughs> I pray and I bring my money, I, I, I give my seed, and, and, and God has just blessed me, and me and my family are just wonderful. Hello, what about your neighbor? Did you notice that there's no smoke coming from the chimney when you're cooking? Have you ever wandered over and said, hey, why don't you come over and have dinner with us tonight? And then get a chance to say, you know why? Because Jesus Christ is number one to me. And he says, go out into all the world and be my number one. And what do you do when you're being Jesus is number one? You practice love. You practice how to be generous. And I'm not talking about gullibly doing things. I'm being, you know, knowing the conditions and the situations. And there you are being Jesus. If we as Christians would, be, would love each other, Regardless of our race, our nationality, our income, 
where we live. Are we middle class? Are we upper class? Are we lower class? That's from the devil. But if we live our lives like Jesus Christ is number one, we would make a difference in the world. Somebody would say, wow, this Jesus fellow really is number one in that person's life. I need to ask some questions about who this Jesus really is. Because if Jesus can do this for this guy, I'm sure that Jesus can do a little something for me. And he can today. So look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, is Jesus Christ number one in your life? Is he? Is he number one? Does he take up does does he does he take up positions in your life that it doesn't matter what comes, Jesus is still there on top? Or Jesus Jesus is your number one when it's convenient. What is it that takes away the number one position of Jesus in your life? Because whatever it is, you gotta drop it. You gotta drop it, beloved. He said, I need to be number one. And he becomes number one when you recognize that I am a sinful individual. I'm wayward. I want my own way. I'm manipulative. I'll do anything to get my own way. You can't call yourself a Christian like that. You got to say, Jesus Christ is number one. And I will... And I refuse, not only I will, but I refuse to make anything or anyone take the place of Jesus in my life. Maybe you, you're out there, you've never really thought about it, and you've never really committed your life to Christ. But the only way you're going to see heaven is when you put Jesus Christ as number one. And you start to do it, do that the day you said, Lord God, I'm a sinner. And I confess it. And Father, I need Jesus. And Jesus Christ, here's my heart. Take it. Come and live in it. Express yourself in it and through it. And make me worthy of carrying that sign that says Jesus Christ is the center of my life. And because Jesus is number one, he has invited us this morning to gather around the communion table for fellowship, for strength, for courage, and to declare in the very act of communion that Jesus Christ is number one. And Jesus Christ is not only number one, but he's Lord, our Lord, and he's the King of Kings, and he's my elder brother. May God help us this morning. That his word will somehow resonate in our spirit. That we will stop thinking selflessly and begin to think that we are in a community and we are called to this community to be a Christ one. Father, we are, we are grateful <clears throat> for the way you have been through eternity. That your one thought is to bring men and women in relationship to yourself. And you knew the kind of children we would be. Some of us are kicking and dragging our feet on the ground. And some of us have just gone wild. And some of us have humbly bowed and realized our condition. And we appeal to your mercy. And you heard and you brought us this far. Continue to work on us, O oh Lord. Continue to express yourself in and through us and help us to recognize that the only one who is number one in our world is Jesus. All others are false and can never get us to the gates of heaven. So we are with the commander of the army of the Lord. And we ask you to bless us this morning, even as we gather around the communion table. In Jesus' name we pray. 
we're going to be singing 407. Just before. 407. We all got it. <clears throat> Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you trusting? blood of the land Thou are you one in the blood Oh in the sins and blood of the land Are your garments spotless Are they white as snow Are you washed in the blood of the land Are you walking by the same <coughs> Do you rest each moment in the soon sea fun? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Are you washed in the blood uh, in the soul? Cleansing blood Number four as the last. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now there's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, are you washed in the blood? We have been given our instructions <clears throat> by the apostles in the Gospels. Paul lays it out very plainly in 1 Corinthians that the very night before Jesus Christ was crucified, he got all his disciples together and he told them, he said, I'm going to be away. I'm going to suffer. They didn't believe it because they were short-sighted. He had taught them for three and a half years. And now came the finality of why he came, right across the door. And so he said, I, this, I'm setting, I'm, I'm, because you see, he knew we would forget. So he said, I'm setting you this. And every time you get together around this table, I want you to remember me. Remember what I've done. Remember what my hopes and dreams for you are. Remember that I am with you. And we're told that he blessed the cup and he blessed the bread and he said these are the new covenant in my blood. And as we come this morning, we're reminded as we enter the Easter season that this is the time we celebrate the coming into the world of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul said, let's then take a little time to examine ourselves, not to see if we qualify, 
We qualify when we ask Jesus Christ to become our Lord and Savior. We don't come because we've been, we know it was communion Sunday, so we've been cleaning up our lives. We're going to be nice on Saturday because we've got to go to communion on Sunday. Because it gives you no merit. It's just a demonstration that we believe what God says. We know that Jesus Christ is present with us. And therefore we can tell him now in our own quiet time saying, Lord God, thank you. That you brought the saints together coming from every avenue of life. From suburbia to the man or woman who's homeless on the street. Because this is what makes us one in Christ. So Lord, we thank you. Father, we are thankful that the blood of Christ cleanses and keep on cleansing the ones who have called out for your mercy and called out to you for cleansing. So we pray right now, Lord, that you'll search us and know our hearts. And search us that we don't get ourselves overly anxious about things because you are in control. And we want to thank you for the cross of Christ, that he conquered it. That he now sits royally, enthroned as a man on our behalf. So forgive our sins and our trespasses and make us worthy participant in this family of God this morning. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we ready? The Bible says after he had prayed and blessed it, he says, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And this is what we're participating this morning. So let us eat together in Jesus' name. Before he gave the cup, the Bible said he prayed. <clears throat> and so today, Lord, we pray that you will hear us, that you will see us, and that you will bless us. 
we need courage to live this life. We need courage to be able to navigate the distractions and concentrating on our number one leader. So Lord, give us the energy and strength we are and we need to fight a good fight. And then having done all, to stand on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, your begotten Son, our Lord, our Savior, our Advocate. Bless your people again through him. Amen. The cup represents the blood of Christ. And the Bible said it cleans and it cleans and it keep on cleaning. So in our belief that this is the victory we have in Christ, let's drink together. Closing hymn is 624. 624. Let's stand and sing as we come to the end of our service today. Asking God's directive and strength and power to go and live another day victoriously for him. There is within my heart a melody. God fill my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings. Stir the cords again. Now, Jesus, 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 He's the sweetest day I know. He fills my heart with longing and the number five. Back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I am sent fly to worlds unknown. 
I shall reign with him on high. Oh, Jesus, 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 sweet as may I know, he fills my heart with longing and he fills me. Aren't you glad that it keeps me singing as I go? You know what that means? Under every condition. We have an enemy who, who will try to distract you this week and say, ah, it was all right for Sunday. But today is Monday. I'm singing to him. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. And the Bible said after they sung a hymn, they went out. Remember where they went? They went to the Garden of Gethsemane where the Bible says the, the stress on Jesus was so empowering, so powerful that he sweat like there was great drops of blood. Why? Because he was dying for me. Not for himself. Nothing that he did. He was dying for you. But at the end of the night, he says, Father, if this cup there's any other way, let it pass. But the Father didn't answer, did he? Because it was in his eternal destiny that this is what's going to happen to redeem you and me. And so he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. You're going to hit some things this week that you're going to have to say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours, Lord. May he give you the strength and the due power to walk in it and to come out victorious at the other hand. So may God bless you and keep you. May God cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.